the evil cord banned by the church. If there's one thing the Catholic Church cannot stand, it's the devil. And if there's one other thing the Catholic Church cannot stand, it's the latest music. So what happens when you combine the devil and the sort of harmony that gets your hips moving? You get banishment. In this case, banishment of the Diabolus in Musica. During the Renaissance in Europe between the 14th and 17th centuries, music wasn't about expression or emotion, especially not in Italy where the church ruled supreme. Music was about praising the Lord. Almost all new music was created specifically for acts of worship, and for that reason new musical compositions needed to be in accordance with the Renaissance view of God. All music associated with God thereby needed to be beautiful. It's not clear precisely how it happened, but somebody high up in the church decided that they didn't like a single musical chord located between the augmented fourth and diminished fifth. It struck a chord with them, pun totally intended, and they banished it from the face of the earth. The chord of evil spans three steps on the musical scale. The Catholics weren't wrong. It is an ugly note. It's not bad by any means, but it is considered to be a very dissonant harmony. If you want to hear the chord for yourself, go ahead and play Black Sabbath on the band's self-titled debut album. Guitarist Tony Iommi said that he liked the note because on guitar it gives off an unsettling feeling. It was this unsettling feeling that got the chord banned, but there was a bit more to it than just somebody being upset. There was rhyme and reason behind the church's banishment of the chord. It makes a surprising amount of sense too. Because music needed to reflect God and because God had created everything, God had created the unpleasant chord. So the higher-ups within the church concluded that the devil had corrupted the chord. God had made it beautiful and the devil ruined it. Therefore, anyone who played the chord was playing Satan's music. Why did Pope Francis wield a sorcerer's staff? In 2018, Pope Francis was spotted wielding a forked bamboo staff that looked suspiciously like an evil sorcerer's staff. Could this be additional proof that the Pope is a demon and the Roman Catholic Church is a secret satanic organization? Maybe I jumped the gun there. Or maybe not. More will be coming up on the bizarre satanic practices of the church later in the video. For now, I want to focus on the weird stuff. It was carried by Pope Francis on October 3rd during the opening mass of the Synod of Bishops. The event is a sort of global meeting of Catholic bishops, led by the Pope himself. The surprise came when instead of holding up a symbol of the church during mass, the Pope wielded a staff as if he were going to cast a level 3 fireball spell. The staff is known as a stang, something with deep ties to occultism. It was supposedly given to the Pope by two young women at a youth rally in Rome about two months earlier. The young women had asked the Pope if he would hold the staff during the upcoming Mass at the Synod of Bishops, which he agreed to happily. In photographs taken on that day, you can see one of the young women with a red string bracelet. Such bracelets are often talismans worn by a variety of anti-Christian practitioners, including practitioners of witchcraft, the Kabbalah, Wicca, and Talmudic Judaism. Stangs have appeared throughout the centuries, almost always as things of evil and magic. This kind of stuff is considered a witch's ceremonial tool, always forked and oftentimes with an iron nail driven through it. The iron nail is said to be a mockery of the crucifixion of Jesus Christ. Christians believe the stang signifies the power of Satan. In this day and age, such tools are often used by traditional witches practicing at home. Sometimes it can represent the Horned One, aka the Devil. Other times it's nothing but a symbolic instrument with its power rooted in nature rather than anything Christian. Whatever the case, evil, wicked, or just a tool of Wicca witches, there's no escaping the fact that Pope Francis still held the staff up at one of the biggest meetings of bishops in the world. This isn't the only time Pope Francis has come under fire for holding up strange-looking things. He has a history of brandishing bizarre crosses. For example, the Communist Cross, which is weird even by Satanist standards. It's a wooden hammer and sickle with Christ on the hammer, his arms lifted to either side of it as if he were on a cross. The Pope even wielded a yin-yang cross with a little heart on it and some fish. Do you think Pope Francis is progressive, or is there something more nefarious going on? Let me know down below. And before we move on to number 11, I need to give a big shout out to Thyronel and Edwin Pina for your continued support and kind words. If you're new here, be sure to subscribe and become part of the Origins Explained family. The Scholomans, Transylvania School of Black Magic. 
Deep in the spookiest realm on Earth, there is said to be an underground school that's the antithesis of Hogwarts. Instead of students coming to this place to learn magic and be contributing members of the wizarding world, students go to the Scholarmans to learn the dark arts of black magic and necromancy. And who runs the classes? You guessed it, the devil himself. This is all according to the folklore of Romania, with the stories going back hundreds of years. The school, hidden where no outsiders can find it in the dreaded Transylvania, only enrolls a handful of students each semester, so that there are no more than ten at once. These ten students are destined to become Solomonari. Solomonari is the Romanian word for a very peculiar type of wizard. A wizard who rides a dragon, controls the weather, and brings down storms from the black skies. To become this horrible sorcerer, students must remain within the Scholomans for seven years. They cannot be exposed to the sunlight during their time in the school. It's no wonder wizards are always so pale and vampire-like in the movies. They have no vitamin D and come from Transylvania. I don't have any proof that the Scholomance is a real place or that it truly teaches dark magic. It only appears in legends. But then it started popping up in literature at the start of the 19th century. One of the earliest written records of the school came from Emily Gerard in her article Transylvanian Superstitions, published in 1885. Many believe that the article was read by Bram Stoker, the grandfather of vampires himself, which he likely used as inspiration for his novel Dracula. Let's say, just for fun, that the Scholomance is a real place. The Vatican is the base of good and light, while the Scholomance is the hub of all things evil. And wouldn't you like to know what the legends say the pupils do for their studies? The curriculum involves learning the language of all living things. Students must also learn the secrets of nature and magic. Pupils are instructed on how to properly cast magic spells. They must know how to control the rain. And of course, they take dragon riding lessons. What do you think? Could you hack it at the Devil's School for Sorcerers? The Templars were secret worshippers of this dark god. There's a secret that has been kept under wraps since the 14th century. A secret so terrible and so world-shattering that you're probably not going to believe it. I don't even know if I believe it. Yet the facts speak for themselves. Baphomet, the demonic entity and mascot for Satanism, was worshipped by the Knights Templar. The Knights Templar were supposed to be an order of good, justice, and righteousness. They were the Jedi of the Middle Ages. Yet in the autumn of 1307, the Church lashed out at the Templars. With help from King Philippe IV of France, the Templars were arrested and charged with blasphemy. There were wild accusations thrown against the Knights Templar. It was said that they denounced the name of Christ, spat on the crucifix, and worshipped false idols. One of those false idols was Baphomet, the most heinous version of Satan ever devised. The Knights Templar refused to confess. So many of them were burned alive as heretics in May of 1310. 54 Templars to be precise. Later in 1312, the order came to an end when the master of the temple, James of Malay, and his colleague, Geoffrey of Charnay, were killed as well. In the 700 years since the Holy Order was abolished, there have been a lot of rumors about what really happened to them. History tells us that the order was founded in 1119 as a military escort service to keep Christian pilgrims safe as they made journeys into the Holy Land. They grew strong, multiplied, and started seizing power across Europe. They had a network of around 870 houses, castles, and banks. Their power is an important aspect to the story because one of the most popular theories today is that they weren't heretics at all. Instead, King Philippe IV owed them a lot of money and was threatened by their power. So he had the knights arrested and tried as blasphemers. If true, it would mean the knights were framed as worshippers of diabolical gods, specifically Baphomet. But who is Baphomet anyway? I can tell you one thing, he's nowhere in the Bible. The devilish deity came out of nowhere. I'll leave you in suspense for now, but there's more on that coming up very soon in the video. Satan, Jesus, Egypt, and the Ankh. Take a look at the Ankh and compare it to the cross. Do you notice anything strange? They are essentially the same symbol, only the Ankh has a loop at the top. The Ankh is also significantly older than the Christian cross and both have a connection to Satanism that you really need to know about. I want to start with the Ankh and its ancient origins. The Egyptians called it the Key of Life or the Cross of Life. Earliest examples of it date back 5,150 years. It's always been the same, a simple cross with a loop. So what's the deal with the loop? It's all about the circle of life. Egyptians believed that death was only the beginning, 
They thought life went on forever, starting with mortal existence and continuing indefinitely through the afterlife. The Ankh is the hieroglyphic symbol for the word life. Egyptian gods were painted in tombs carrying the Ankh. This thing is everywhere in Egyptian ruins, from temples to pyramids. Then, in the 4th century AD, it started to appear in the Coptic Christian community. It changed from being an ancient symbol of eternal life to being a symbol of Christ's promise of everlasting life. And here's a weird fact the church doesn't talk about. Early Christians in Rome, the center of the church's domain, didn't use the cross as a sign of their faith. For them, the cross was a morbid symbol. Remember that the cross was a form of execution, even if it was associated with Jesus. It would be like if you wore an amulet depicting a lethal injection around your neck. Christians in Rome used the fish, an ancient pagan symbol for fertility, to show their devotion to Jesus. It's another amazing example of how closely related to paganism early Christianity was. Even the symbols were the same. Throughout the first 3,000 years of Egyptian history, the Ankh was most closely associated with the cult of Osiris, the Egyptian god of the dead. Coincidentally, Osiris' story was all about resurrection and rebirth, just like Jesus' story. So it was fitting that his ank would be transformed into Christ's cross. But what about the devil? In modern times, the ank has been linked with paganism and Satanism. It's sometimes used as a talisman in ceremonial magic and occultism. Peace for Satan. The truth of the peace sign is going to make you gasp. It might even make you run outside to your driveway and rip that peace sticker right off your bumper. Many people believe that the peace sign is actually an anti-Christian symbol, a symbol known as the Nero Cross. The peace sign is a circle with a vertical line through its center. Branching off from the line are two more lines, creating little pie triangles. It's been said that the lines are a broken cross, not just an upside-down cross, but an inverted cross that's been broken to symbolize the power of Satan. Frightening, right? It would be if it were true, but it's not. The peace sign was designed by a guy named Gerald Holtum in 1958, and it has a very clear history. The next time you hear somebody try to denounce the peace symbol as a satanic sign, you can tell them this. During the British campaign for nuclear disarmament, Holtum went about developing a symbol that could be seen as the universal sign of peace. The vertical line in the center represents the flag semaphore signal for the letter D. The semaphore flagging system is a way to convey letters and words by waving flags. The downward lines on either side represent the letter N. Together, you get nuclear disarmament. The peace symbol is perfectly safe to use, even if it does sometimes get mixed up with Satanism. The Templars and their Dark Lord Baphomet now let's get back to the Templars and their devil worship. I left off just before revealing the truth of Baphomet, and I won't keep you waiting any longer. We've all seen pictures of Baphomet and can recognize him immediately. He's the poster child for Satanism, after all. You probably remember earlier this year when a man destroyed the statue of Baphomet at the Iowa capital. These days, Baphomet is a synonym for Satan. But a thousand years ago, the very first reference of him appeared in a letter written by a French crusader in 1098. The crusader claimed that in the Holy Land, Muslims called upon a creature named Baphomet before they went into battle. It was like Vikings screaming Valhalla before charging into an epic fight. Most scholars agree this was a corruption or misspelling of Muhammad, the prophet who founded Islam in the 7th century. Christians perceived Islam as the worship of Muhammad, not Allah. This was the same in the eyes of medieval Christians as worshipping the devil. Baphomet became Baphomet and eventually became a version of Satan. But in reality, it was likely a misunderstanding, and there was never a deity named Baphomet. His whole existence is nothing but a medieval typo. Or is it? History can be tricky. Nobody knows that better than those of you who frequent the channel. There is a possibility that Baphomet had nothing to do with Muhammad. The Templars could have really been heretics. Maybe not Satanists, but they could have secretly been Gnostics. Gnostics were extremely popular in the first few centuries after the death of Christ. But as the Roman Church gained power, most Gnostic religious sects were destroyed. They had some weird beliefs, like that the material reality of the universe was corrupt. They believed the God of the Old Testament was an evil force and that Jesus Christ was a sort of energy ghost. Gnostic beliefs can get really confusing, plus there were hundreds of them with their own unique twists. It's known that the Templars were secretive and sneaky. They gathered in strange underground chambers to hold covert meetings. 
Nobody knows what happened in those meetings or what strange initiation ceremonies they held, but it's possible they were still practicing a version of Gnosticism that focused on worshipping a forgotten god named Baphomet. St. Andrew's Cross The Scottish flag is probably not something you think about very often, especially not when it comes to Satan. But take a look at the Scottish flag and tell me, what do you see? A big white X against a blue background, right? But is that an X or a cross shaped like an X? The history of the Scottish flag is bloody, brutal and full of surprises. The man you see here is St. Andrew, carved of oak. The picture was taken from the Kingdom of Scots Gallery at the National Museum of Scotland. Andrew is dressed in long robes, carrying a great big cross in his left hand and holding his books in his right hand. It was probably carved around 1500 AD. Andrew was the brother of Peter, both of whom were disciples of Jesus Christ. They were in his cozy group of twelve and both met horrendous ends. Andrew was distinguished from the other apostles in that he was also a disciple of St. John the Baptist. You know, before he became St. John the Headless. Little is known about Andrew's early life. After Jesus died, Peter became the first pope of the church and met his end in Rome. Peter was crucified upside down, making the inverted cross one of the first great holy symbols of Christianity. Yes, the upside down cross is a holy sign connected to St. Peter, Pope Numero Uno. It was only recently that the inverted cross became a symbol of evil and the devil. Andrew also met his end upon the cross. He was crucified on what's called a saltire or an X-shaped cross. And just like his brother Peter, Andrew didn't see himself as worthy of dying in the same way as his Lord Jesus Christ. So he was nailed to an X-shaped cross. Every year on November 30th, the martyrdom of St. Andrew is celebrated around the world. Many pilgrims make their way to the city of St. Andrews in Scotland, formerly called Fife. The weird part is that nobody really knows why the Scots adopted Andrew as their patron saint. He died in the Greek city of Patras, far away from Scotland. One legend is that a monk in the 4th century was approached by an angel. The angel told the monk named Saint Regulus to bring Andrew's bones from their resting place in Constantinople to Fife. He did, and later a cathedral was built on the very spot. As for the Satan connection, it's a little less obvious than the inverted cross of St. Peter, which should be holy but is definitely used as a satanic symbol. The X appears now and again in relation to unholy things, but the truth is that most people don't even know what it is. The Roman Cult of Satan There are so many heretical symbols that can be found in just about every church across the country, it's, quite frankly, astonishing. It's why more and more Christians are starting to believe that the Roman Catholic Church is secretly a satanic cult, and you might too by the end of this video. I'm going to be talking about a whole heap of symbols right now, starting with the Cairo. It's a symbol you can see in plenty of churches. It looks like a P with a long line cutting straight through the center of an X-shaped cross. It's also known as Constantine's Cross and is supposedly the monogram of Christ. Legend has it that Roman Emperor Constantine used the symbol after converting the Roman Empire to an officially Christian nation. He apparently saw it in a dream, so he turned it into the battle standard of his army. However, its original meaning is much different. The Cairo was a symbol of the god of time, Kronos. It was also an emblem associated with pagan solar deities. It may have been taken from the Ankh which I told you about earlier. The Celtic cross is another one you can see for yourself in plenty of modern churches. It's a cross but has a circle around it. It's typically meant as a representation of the crucifixion of Jesus Christ. The Celtic cross is far older than Jesus. It's also called the Ionic cross, with its roots going back 6,000 years. Nobody knows quite what it was used for, only that it was a symbol of the Celtic people long before Christianity. It may have been an early symbol of the Gallic sun god, Tyrannus. It only became a Christian symbol after the Celtic people were converted and Saint Columba traveled to Ireland. One of the most controversial symbols is the Jesus fish. It has a bizarre history and has meant a lot of different things over the years. These days it's a symbol of Jesus, but thousands of years ago it was used by the pagans. The Jesus fish was associated with the goddess Venus and was meant to represent female genitalia. You can even see examples of the baby Jesus within early versions of the symbol in ancient works of art. Before it was a fish, it symbolized the womb of the Virgin Mary. It slowly evolved from being associated with Venus to being Mary's actual womb. 
Even though it did change, the Jesus fish still symbolized the same thing. It was all about birth, a woman's ability to give life and fertility. Nowadays, people slap Jesus fish magnets on their fridges and cars. Are these symbols proof of satanic work happening inside the church? Or are these symbols proof of how much paganism went into building the Christian faith? There are other symbols I just don't have time to mention, like the Eye of Horus, the Masonic Pyramid, the SPQR symbol, and the Madonna Lily. But don't worry, I'll be doing more videos, so be sure to check back soon. Santa Muerte, a mix of Satanism, Catholicism, and ancient Aztec beliefs. One of the fastest growing folk religions in the world, has been denounced as pure Satanism by Catholic priests. It's the newest religious sect with mass appeal sweeping the globe. After starting in Mexico, the cult of Santa Muerte has become an international sensation. Santa Muerte has a reputation for being a death cult, with its primary members being drug traffickers, murderers, and criminals. In rundown areas of Guadalajara and Mexico City, there are small temples dedicated to Santa Muerte. At first glance, there doesn't seem to be anything satanic about them. If you speak a bit of Spanish, you probably already know that Santa Muerte means Saint Death. Although her followers also call her the Bony Lady because, well, she's kind of the Grim Reaper. Catholic priests have denounced all worship of Santa Muerte as Satan worship. It's frightening Christians around the world because millions of people are allegedly performing Satanic Mass. There are an estimated 12 million followers of Santa Muerte around the world, but it could be even more. Mr. Santana, whose name sounds suspiciously like Satan, said ritual worship of Santa Muerte is not the Black Mass. Mr. Santana is the one who gives Mass at the Santa Muerte Temple in Guadalajara, so he would know. He said that the service isn't evil in the slightest, and neither is Santa Muerte. Saint Death, in Santana's own words, is simply fulfilling God's orders. She gives people what they want, and when they finish their life on Earth, she comes to claim their souls. But there's so much more going on here than just a new saint. Santa Muerte has a lot in common with an ancient Aztec goddess. Before the 16th century, the Aztecs celebrated a festival of death every year in August. The deity most closely connected to the celebration was Mictacasahuatl, the goddess of death. Then, when the Spanish arrived, they tried to shift the Aztec traditions to be more like their Catholic traditions. The Spanish encouraged the conquered Aztec to honor their dead on All Souls Day. This became the modern celebration of the Day of the Dead, which is an incredible fusion of Aztec tradition and Spanish Catholicism. Over the last decade or so, Santa Muerte has taken a more prominent role in Day of the Dead festivities, and now locals are starting to recognize her as the reincarnation of Mictecasahuatl. This is an Aztec goddess being brought back from extinction but not according to Christians, who say this is all the work of the devil. The Vatican has been extremely outspoken about Santa Muerte. They've condemned the new religion. Catholic bishops throughout the U.S. have expressed concern over the increasing popularity of Santa Muerte. She has caused a massive panic within the church. But is this Satan trying to win souls like the church says? Or is Santa Muerte the first step in the old Aztec gods reappearing after 500 years? Could we see the rebirth of old gods in our lifetime? Let me know what you think in the comments. The Vatican's Very Weird Magic Pine Cone The Fontana della Pina in the Vatican is a water fountain. Translated into English, it's the Fountain of the Pine Cone. It's named after the humongous bronze pine cone that was originally at the center of a Roman fountain in the first century AD. Welcome to the weird obsession the Vatican has with pine cones. If it was only the fountain, I wouldn't be telling you about this. One pine cone wouldn't be considered unusual, but when you look around, you start to notice a little too many pine cones. There's one on the Pope's staff. His hat is kind of shaped like a pine cone. The pine cone is on the coat of arms of the Holy See and the Vatican flag. Okay, so the church is obsessed with pine cones. What's the big deal? The big deal is that for centuries, pine cones have been symbols of magic. They've been associated with the ancient god Baal, pagan rituals, fertility goddesses, and the third eye. The third eye is the most intriguing aspect of the pine cone. When you say third eye to someone, they probably think about astral projection and clairvoyance. But the truth is that there is a real third eye in your body. It's called the pineal gland, situated at the geometric center of the human brain. 
It's linked to your body's perception of light and is believed to regulate sleep patterns, but it also does other stuff that scientists don't even know about. It's a huge mystery because the tiny gland, which is shaped exactly like a pine cone, receives far more blood flow than nearly any other part of the body except the kidneys. The tiny gland has been a sacred thing throughout history. Somehow, almost every ancient civilization understood the importance of the pineal gland and connected it to the pine cone. 3,200 years ago, the Egyptian staff of Osiris depicted two intertwining serpents with a pine cone at the top. This was almost identical to the Indian Kundalini. Kundalini is a spiritual energy that's depicted as two serpents coiling up the base of the human spine to the pineal gland at the moment of enlightenment. Hindu gods were frequently depicted in artwork holding out a pine cone in an outstretched hand. So were the Anunnaki gods of the ancient Sumerians. And so was Chikomecuatl, the Aztec goddess of agriculture, depicted as a snake holding a pine cone. The Romans associated pine cones with Venus, the goddess of love. The Celts associated pine cones with regeneration and fertility. They'd even put them under their pillow at night to help them conceive. Across the ancient world, in almost every civilization, pine cones were associated with snakes, fertility, enlightenment, and cosmic wisdom. This is despite the fact that many of the civilizations never met one another. They all came to the same conclusion on their own. Pine cones look like the pineal gland, and the pineal gland is extremely important. You would think that the Vatican, a place so against pagan gods and symbolism, would stop putting pine cones on everything. The Pope has an actual staff that looks nearly identical to the Egyptian staff of Osiris. You already saw earlier in the video how the Pope was using a stang, which is basically a wizard's staff. So what does all this mean? Not so scary pentagram. The most evil symbol in the world is definitely the pentagram. When you see a pentagram, and especially an inverted pentagram, the first thing that comes to mind is a satanic ritual. You likely imagine someone standing in the center of a chalk-drawn pentagram who's trying to summon the forces of darkness. But did you know that this dark symbol has its roots in holiness? Going even further back in time, the pentagram was used in Japanese religion to symbolize the five elements of life. It was a magic symbol for the Japanese and for the Chinese as well. Even in Babylonian culture before the invention of Judaism, the pentagram was a symbol of the Anunnaki gods. It was only recently that the pentagram became scary. Early Christian symbolism had the pentagram being a sign of Christ. It was originally used by Christians to represent the five wounds Jesus suffered during the crucifixion. It was used before the cross because, as you learned earlier, the cross wasn't originally holy. When the cross did grow in popularity, it replaced the pentagram. It lost its importance for years, making a comeback in the 1800s. The pentagram started to be seen as a symbol of evil and black magic. The stigma stuck, and now it's unlikely that the pentagram will ever be a holy symbol of Jesus again. What is Satanism anyway? Speaking of the pentagram, it's the official symbol of the Church of Satan. The inverted pentagram with Baphomet first appeared in 1968. Then it was printed on the cover of the Satanic Bible the next year. But just what is Satanism? It all starts with the man himself, the big bad guy, Satan. Satan first appeared thousands of years before Christianity as the figure Angra Mainyu in Zoroastrianism. He was later portrayed as an evil entity in Jewish Kabbalism. In the Bible, Satan was an accusing angel featured in the Book of Job. In the Book of Enoch, Satan was a fallen angel. Satan has undergone more changes than nearly any other figure in history. He's been around for thousands of years and has been worshipped under many names. In the 14th century, people started viewing Satan as an anti-hero. He was still a monster, but the Romantics cast him in a more admirable light. He became a rebel who defied the authority of God. Even though Christianity reigned supreme, people liked the idea of rebellion behind closed doors. In the 19th century, William Blake illustrated Paradise Lost and presented Satan as a sort of messiah. Theologians started thinking of Satan more as an anarchist than an actual antichrist. Alistair Crowley, at the beginning of the 20th century, celebrated the devil as the greatest rebel who ever lived. Crowley, as despicable as he was, shot Satanism into the mainstream. Sixty years ago, Anton LaVey was a carnival worker taking night classes on the occult. He would be the one to form the modern Church of Satan in April of 1966. He became the first black pope and the father of the real Satanist religion that has its own statue at the Iowa Capitol. 
There are some pieces of history the church would prefer people didn't know about. Today I'll tell you how the cross began as a pagan symbol. I'll tell you about the bizarre priest hunters that once terrorized England, and I'll tell you all about how Hinduism may have inspired the Holy Trinity. T for Tammuz. I want you to remember that T stands for Tammuz. The next time you look at a cross, remember that long before the Christians used it, the cross was the symbol of a mighty pagan deity from Mesopotamia. The cross got its beginnings as a pagan idol. But what you might find even more interesting is that nowhere in the New Testament or the Old Testament is the cross mentioned as a holy symbol. In the earliest Christian writings after Jesus' death, they didn't talk about a cross. It didn't become a Christian icon until hundreds of years later. Where the cross first appeared was in ancient Babylon, or more specifically, Babylon's central territory of Chaldea. It was in this region that people worshipped Tammuz with all their hearts. The T didn't literally stand for Tammuz because they weren't speaking English, but it was the shape of the mystic Tau, which was the initial of the god's name. It wasn't only the Babylonians who used the symbol. The Tau found its way across Mesopotamia and the known world, with people worshipping Tammuz in the Roman Empire. A Syria, and even Egypt. Speaking of Egypt, they had their own version of the cross that was even older. They started using the Ankh in the earliest days of their religion 500 years ago. The events of the Old Testament didn't happen until 3,000 years ago. The Ankh, also called the Tree of Life or the Cross of Life, dates to at least 3150 BC. The use of the cross as a Christian symbol only came about 300 years after Jesus died. It was during the reign of Roman Emperor Constantine. He he was the one who converted the Roman Empire to Christianity after the Battle of Milvian Bridge in 312 AD. What happened next is something the church doesn't like to talk about. With the legalization of Christianity under Constantine, corruption spread like wildfire. Constantine understood the power of uniting all the people of Europe under one common religion. It was the biggest power play in history. The problem at first was the rampant paganism. In order to make Christianity really stick, corrupt Roman Catholic officials understood they needed to mix paganism with Christianity. They accepted certain ideas and symbols because it helped evangelize pagans. One of those symbols was the cross, which was converted to be a sign of Jesus' crucifixion. In the early days of Christianity, Mary was worshipped as a deity. She wasn't just the mother of Jesus. Pagans were more used to worshipping goddesses, so Mary as a god rather than just a woman helped the religious movement. But wait a minute, I haven't told you anything about Tammuz yet. He was the powerful god of fertility. He was also the son of a more famous Babylonian god named Enki, who is at the center of the Mesopotamian flood myth. You know, the one the Bible allegedly copied. It's called the Eridu Genesis and is nearly identical to the biblical flood, only with a guy named Utnapishtim instead of Noah. Tammuz was worshipped by the people of Babylon at two major annual festivals. One happened in the early spring, around the same time people today celebrate Easter. Coincidence? I don't think so. The early spring celebration was all about Tammuz and his marriage to the goddess Inanna, which symbolized the bounty of nature that was to come in the following year. The other celebration was in the summer. It was the celebration of Tammuz's death at the hands of demons. Chronicles of the Kings of Israel The Chronicles of the Kings of Israel is mentioned many, many times in the Bible. It comes up frequently in the Old Testament, typically in reference to ancient kings of Israel. The reason it's so controversial is that scholars suspect whoever wrote the Bible copied a lot of their information from this other book. The thing about the Bible is that it kind of glosses over a whole bunch of Israeli kings. And when it's doing that, the Bible points to a secondary book in which you can find more information about said kings. For example, take a listen to this passage from 1 Kings chapter 14, verse 19. And the rest of the acts of Jeroboam, how he warred and how he reigned, behold, they are written in the book of the Chronicles of the Kings of Israel. Similar passages are all throughout the Book of Kings, mentioning rulers like Ahaziah, Elah, Zimri, Jeroboam II, and Menachem. Biblical scholars suspect this mystery book is one of the lost texts of the Old Testament. It was likely included in early copies of the Hebrew Bible, but was removed at some point. This isn't confirmed, but experts do suspect it was an original part of the Old Testament. 
Even if it wasn't included in the original biblical text, scholars are fairly certain it was used as a source for biblical stories. This book was sort of like a textbook that contained information about kings and their reigns. Whoever wrote the Bible used it to make their stories authentic by including real historical kings and events. This is not something the church likes to discuss because it takes away from the authenticity of the Bible. The Weird Tale of the Knights of the Star You've heard of the Knights Templar, but how much do you know about the Knights of the Star? If you're like most people, the answer is probably not much. The story of these bizarre knights has been suppressed by the church. Yet in the 14th century they were created by the Pope and wore pentagrams as their symbols of power. In the summer of 1344, Pope Clement VI began to reorganize the various knight groups in France. This was not even 30 years after Pope Clement V had dissolved the Knights Templar in 1312, with many of the Templars being burned at the stake for heresy. Pope Clement VI suggested the Duke of Normandy should establish an organization known as the Knights of the Star. The Duke would be able to pick the Knights himself. Each one he picked was given an exceptional privilege, a privilege typically reserved for members of the Pope's inner circle. Any knight who agreed to join the order would be officially absolved of all their sins. That's the great thing about the Christian church. You can do the most atrocious thing ever, but with a wave of his hand, the pope or one of his cronies can absolve you. For the Knights of the Star, this was like having a license to sin. The Duke of Normandy, upon the death of his father, King Philip VI of France, became King John II of France in 1350. That was when he took the Pope up on his offer of having his own company of knights. The order was officially founded on January 16, 1351. In the Middle Ages, the pentagram was not a thing of evil. It was a holy symbol and the heraldic symbol of John II. It was seen as such a godly sign that he chose it for his personal coat of arms. The pentagram was meant to be symbolic of the Star of Bethlehem, so John had his knights wear the pentagram on their garments. These days, the holy knights would be seen as Satanists. This was almost like a soft reboot of the Knights Templar, which was founded in 1119. Just like how there were originally nine members of the Knights Templar, the Order of the Star first consisted of nine worthy warriors. The order fell apart very quickly. When the knights entered the order, they had to swear never to retreat from battle. The year after they were founded at the Battle of Moran in 1352, 89 members died because they lost a fight but weren't allowed to retreat. Four years later in 1356, nearly every last member was killed at the Battle of Poitiers. And then that was pretty much the end of it. And now for number 7, but first I wanted to give a big shout out to Poor Pets World and Lack of Rimmelpool. Thanks so much for watching and supporting OE. If you're new here, be sure to subscribe and join the family. The Nephilim Pharaohs and their Anakim offspring The Bible mentions a strange group of giants most people have never even heard of before. They aren't the Nephilim, nor are they the Rephaim. Today I'm telling you about the Anakim and how they may have been related to the alien pharaohs of ancient Egypt. In the Bible, the Anakim are described as the remnants of the original inhabitants of Palestine, even before the Canaanites. The Bible also says the Anakim were of the same race as the Egyptian kings. Notice it doesn't say as the Egyptians, but as the Egyptian kings. You'll see the importance of this in a minute. The Israelites were terrified of the Anakim, whom they described as giants. When the Israelites arrived in the Promised Land after fleeing Egypt, they were disturbed to find the Anakim living there. The Israelites compared themselves to grasshoppers next to the giants. Joshua did ultimately destroy the Anakim, but only because they couldn't defend themselves from the might of God. With the giants out of the way, the Israelites were able to occupy the lands that were promised to them. But where did these giants come from? They came from the Nephilim, who according to the Old Testament were the children of men of God and daughters of man. In other words, they were the abominations created when angels seduced human women. In the Book of Numbers, the Israelites clearly identify the Anakim as the descendants of those original giants. A few Nephilim must have somehow survived the flood and continued to breed, but Joshua and his army put an end to that tainted bloodline once and for all. Now I'd like to introduce you to Sarnacht, ruler of Egypt during the Third Dynasty, around the year 2700 BC. The pharaoh's incredible bones were discovered in 1901 in a tomb buried near Beit Kala. The bones shocked archaeologists because they were huge. Even today, scientists accept that pharaoh Sarnacht was an actual giant, 
A new study even found he could be the oldest human giant ever discovered. This is a huge deal because, like I mentioned earlier, the Bible says the Anakim were the same race as Egyptian kings. There have been rumors for decades that the earliest pharaohs were either part alien or part giant. With the discovery of Sarnacht bones, archaeologists proved the rumors are rooted in reality. He wasn't as tall as you might be thinking, but was still a giant for the era. Sarnacht stood just 6 feet 2 inches tall. Considering the average height of men 4,700 years ago was barely more than 5.5 feet, he was monstrously tall. He would have loomed above his subordinates like a giant. Scientists have tried to dismiss the importance of the king's height in a number of ways. For example, scientists have said Egyptian kings probably ate better food, which allowed them to grow taller than the average person. But when you look at Pharaoh Ramesses II, the next tallest recorded ancient Egyptian pharaoh, he was only 5 foot 9, and Ramesses lived a thousand years after Sarnacht. Clearly, diet didn't have much to do with it. So the big question, was the Third Dynasty king a descendant of the Nephilim? Egyptologist Michael Habisht from the University of Zurich said, probably not. Michael's recent study revealed that Sarnacht's bones show evidence of exuberant growth, suggesting a condition known as gigantism. Plus, there hasn't been another Egyptian royal ever found that was as tall as Sarnacht. What do you think is the case here? Is the Bible lying about giants on Earth? Or is one set of huge bones enough to convince you that Egyptian rulers had Nephilim blood in their veins? The Hindu Trinity Hinduism is considered the oldest living religion in the world. It isn't the oldest religion ever, but it is the oldest one that's still practiced. The ancient Hindu scripture began to be written over 4,000 years ago. It's changed and grown so much over the past four millennia that there is no singular practice considered true Hinduism. But there is one thing Hinduism has that might surprise you. There are three major deities that make up what's known as the Hindu Trinity. This was long before the Holy Trinity in the Christian religion. In Hinduism, the Trinity is known as the Trimurti, or Three Forms. The trio includes Brahma, Vishnu, and Shiva. On the other side, Christianity has the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. But do you know what the Trinity is exactly? The concept behind the Holy Trinity is that God exists perpetually in three forms. The three are all one God, equal and eternal, with precisely the same attributes. It's meant as a beautiful expression of how complex the nature of God is. Let's start with the Father, who is the source of all things and the creator of the universe. In biblical scripture, the Father is described as a loving and just God. He upholds the moral order of the universe. The Son is the physical form of God, aka Jesus Christ. The Son was the Father in human form, able to experience the full range of human emotions. By taking on human flesh, God displayed his commitment to humanity. In this way, Jesus was never a man at all. He was only ever God, just in a skin suit, which is why Jesus Christ is considered the Savior. Then there is the Holy Spirit, which is the godly essence behind wisdom and understanding. The Holy Spirit is meant to be God's will. It's still God, but the Spirit is more like His guidance, which encompasses all aspects of a person's life. The Holy Spirit is the energy in the world that makes God tangible. Now let's move back over to Hinduism. The first part of their trinity is Brahma, the creator god who brought all the universe into existence. Based on that definition, Brahma is sort of like the father. He is depicted in ancient artwork as a bearded man with red or golden skin. He's also the source of all wisdom in the world. Then there is Vishnu, the deity who maintains the balance of all things. Vishnu is considered the god of preservation and the protector of the universe. He is depicted as a human with blue skin and four arms. He needs all those arms for protecting reality. Vishnu also returns to the Earth every now and again when times get tough. Typically, he visits Earth in the form of a human to restore the balance between good and evil. Vishnu is clearly the son of the Hindu trinity. That leaves Shiva, Lord of Destruction. Shiva is the antithesis of Brahma. Where Brahma creates, Shiva destroys, representing the last cycle in existence. I can't compare Shiva to the Holy Spirit. Instead, Shiva is more like Satan. He's even depicted in Hindu art with a serpent around his neck, reminiscent of that pesky snake in the Garden of Eden. But unlike the devil, Shiva isn't an evil entity. Shiva destroys things that are evil, expired or out of time. Shiva is just as important as the other gods because death is just as important as life. 
It's impossible to say if Christians came up with their idea for the Holy Trinity from the Hindu Trimurti, but it's definitely possible. On a side note, you might like to know there's also something called a Tridevi, the Holy Trinity of Hindu goddesses. Brahma, Vishnu, and Shiva each have their own consort, Saraswati, Lakshmi, and Parvati. The Horror of the Priest Hole There was a time not too long ago, only about 500 years back, that Catholics were mercilessly persecuted. In 1558, when Queen Elizabeth I of England took the throne, she went to war against the Roman Catholic Church. This is one episode in church history that they would rather leave buried. Priests were imprisoned, tortured, and often executed. Wealthy Catholic families were so terrified of the English authorities that they built secret chambers in their homes. The chambers were called priest holes used to hide priests like how some Germans hid Jewish people in their attics during World War II. Except instead of SS officers with shiny black boots and swastikas, 16th century England had Perseverance, also known as priest hunters. It's wild to think that after the Inquisition but before the witch trials were over, England had actual priest hunters who went around killing priests. You might be wondering how this could happen. It all started in 1537 with King Henry VIII. He wanted to separate the Church of England from the Roman Catholic Church. This brought about the Reformation, and things really hit their stride under Queen Elizabeth. Elizabeth passed a new law that made it high treason for any Catholic priest to enter England. Any priest caught in the country was legally allowed to be killed. This led to the creation of the Jesuit Order. The Jesuits were created in 1540 as a band of religious ninjas. They were to sneak into England and support Catholic families who were hiding priests in their houses. But they were still no match for the priest hunters. Hunters. These hunters would tirelessly root through homes in search of hidden priests. Priest holes became public knowledge, so it was very risky to hide a man of God in your home. Priest holes also had to be built strategically so that the hunters couldn't find them. One of the most famous constructor of priest holes was Nicholas Owen, who happened to be the brother of a Jesuit. Nobody knows exactly how many lives he saved thanks to his ingenious holes, but it must have been a lot. Sadly, Owens couldn't save his own life. In 1605, he hid himself in one of his priest holes. But at the brink of starvation, Nicholas was forced to reveal himself to the priest hunters who had been waiting for 12 days in the house. He was then taken to the Tower of London, stretched on a rack, and killed. In 1970, Nicholas Owen was officially made a saint by Pope Paul VI. The Roman Catholic Church remained illegal in England until the 1800s. The spirit lingers for three days. The majority of religious people in the world currently believe in two possible final destinations. Christianity and Islam both believe in a heaven and hell. But did you know it was the Persians who came up with it first? And did you know it was the Persians who came up with the idea of purgatory way before the Catholics? Zoroastrianism took over Persia in 1500 BC. The prophet Zoroaster was responsible for reforming the last 2,000 years of gods and beliefs into one organized religion. This religion consisted of a mighty god named Ahura Mazda. But he wasn't the only deity. He was the leader and singular master of everything, but there were still other gods, such as Mithra, god of the rising sun, and Anahita, goddess of fertility and healing. It was Mithra, by the way, who the Romans would later adopt as the god of their Mithraic mystery cult. Zoroastrianism also had its own spirits, angels, and supernatural beings. The stories were populated by peri, which were sort of like fairies. And then there were jinn, also called genies. The supernatural creatures roamed the physical plane and influenced human behavior. They also had their own version of Satan, a being named Angramanu. And Zoroastrianism had their own version of Adam and Eve. Their names were Masha and Mashyanag, and they lived in a beautiful paradise. Just the two of them, with nothing but unspoiled nature and their god. It sounds a little familiar, doesn't it? I think it sounds an awful lot like Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden. The parallels between Zoroastrianism and Christianity are numerous. But let's get down to the afterlife. It was believed that when a person died, their soul hung out near their body for a little while. Persians thought the soul needed to take a bit of a break between dying and moving into the afterlife. For approximately three days, the soul loitered. Then it descended into the land of the dead. Three days is the key takeaway here. Do you know what else took three days? 
Jesus Christ's resurrection. Could this be a coincidence or is this another aspect of Zoroastrianism plagiarized by Christians? I should tell you one more thing because I know you'll find it fascinating. Persians believed those initial three days after a person died were critical to their reaching the afterlife. For those three days, the deceased one's family and friends would fast and lose themselves in prayer. They believed the dead one's soul was disoriented and could be attacked by demons. Prayer helped keep the demons away. They would even bring in a dog as part of the Sagdid ritual, believing dogs could defend against evil spirits trying to destroy the loitering soul. The Temptation of the Buddha Jesus Christ was tempted three times by the devil. The Buddha was tempted three times by his own devil. But if that's true, who was tempted first? It was the Buddha because he lived over 500 years before Jesus Christ was born. Jesus went into the wilderness where he was to ponder what God wanted of him. He fasted for 40 days and 40 nights. During his fasting, the devil showed up. He told Jesus that he could easily change stone to bread, ending his suffering. Jesus said no, resisting the first temptation. The second temptation was when the devil brought Jesus to the top of a temple. The devil told Jesus to throw himself off the temple, allowing the angels of heaven to catch him, because surely God wouldn't allow Jesus to fall to his death. This would prove Jesus was the Son of God. But Jesus resisted, telling Satan that he would not put the Lord God to the test. The third and final temptation was when Satan brought Jesus to the top of a mountain from which he could see all the kingdoms of the world. The devil told Jesus that if he would worship him instead of God, Jesus could become king of the world. But Jesus resisted the temptation. Almost the exact same thing happened to the Buddha, only with slightly different temptations. The demon Mara first sent three beautiful women to seduce Gautama, which is the Buddha's real name. But he was beyond the temptations of the flesh. Mara tempted him two more times, once with the strength of an army and again with a temptation of power. Buddha never gave in, just like Jesus never gave in. The temptations are different, but the principles are the same. It's yet more evidence that Jesus' teachings stemmed from Buddhism, Noah of ancient Greek. You a story from ancient Greece, and I want you to listen closely for anything that sounds familiar. The tale begins with Zeus, god of thunder, master of lightning and king of Olympus. While he sat upon his divine throne, he looked down on the people of the world, and he didn't like what he was seeing. Zeus thought the people were rude, sinful, and just generally unpleasant. The gears were turning in his head. Zeus was getting some thoughts about maybe getting rid of the annoying humans. But first he would pay Earth a visit. Zeus beamed himself down to the house of Lycaon, king of Arcadia. The king was so thrilled to have Zeus in his city that he went about preparing a grand feast in his honor. But then things got really weird. King Lycaon wanted to test just how clever Zeus really was. So what do you do when you want to test somebody's intelligence? In Lycaon's mind, the thing to do was kill his own son, then cook him and serve him to Zeus at a feast. Weird, right? Lycaon figured if Zeus ate his child, he wouldn't be such an all-knowing god after all. Zeus figured out what the king was doing right away. He was outraged and left back to Mount Olympus before the feast could even get started. He summoned the Council of Gods, and together they decided humanity's fate was sealed. The humans had to be obliterated. First, Zeus threw thunderbolts at Lycaon's palace. Then he turned the king into a wolf, but it didn't really matter because what Zeus did next was epic. He summoned a flood that swept across the world, drowning everybody. Almost everybody. It's at this point that Prometheus enters the myth. You might remember Prometheus from the tale of mankind and fire. He was the titan who went against Zeus's orders by giving humans fire. Being able to manipulate fire allowed men and women to build cities and crawl out of their caves. As punishment, Prometheus was chained to a rock. Every day an eagle flew down to eat Prometheus's guts. Then he healed at night, only to have the whole thing happen the next day. On and on for eternity. Talk about a living nightmare. Mare. Prometheus had, I'm not sure how, seeing as he was chained to a rock, managed to sire a son named Deucalion. For the second time, Prometheus went against Zeus by warning his human son of the incoming flood. Prometheus said that to avoid the flood, Deucalion must build a giant boat. He then got on the boat with his wife Pyrrha just as Zeus began flooding the planet. When Zeus noticed the couple still alive, he decided to spare them. The flood waters receded after nine days. Deucalion's boat came to rest on Mount 
Mount Parnassus. You've most likely picked up the similarities by now. This ancient Greek myth is very similar to the Biblical Flood and the Eridu Genesis Flood from Babylon. Only there's one big difference, and it comes at the end. Instead of repopulating the Earth like Noah and his wife, Deucalia and Pyrrha created a new race of humans with help from Themis, the goddess of divine law and the order of the cosmos. They didn't do it by breeding. Instead, new humans just kind of sprouted from the ground. Inside the Tower of Babel In ancient Babylon, a great tower was made whose top was to reach the heavens. In this, the Bible was not lying. The Tower of Babel was a real structure, one with a very interesting story behind it. What the church doesn't want you to know is how much the true story of Babylon's Etam and Anki differs from their own mystical tale. In the Bible, the Tower of Babel was built in defiance of God. The people of Babylon constructed a tower that would be so high that they could climb to heaven. God, furious at the hubris of humans, smashed the tower to pieces. God didn't just smash the tower, he also smashed human language. The Bible says that God splintered human language into hundreds of dialects, thereby preventing humans from ever working together again. This was how the Bible explained there being so many different languages. In reality, the Babylonians did build a tower. It was a stepped pyramid or ziggurat that climbed a shocking 300 feet up into the sky. That's the same height as the famous flat iron skyscraper in New York City, which was built in 1902. From the bottom, the Etamananki looked like an enormous staircase moving up into the clouds. It had seven levels, was made of clay, and was at the exact center of the universe. At least, that was what the Babylonians believed. They believed the Etamananki marked the spot where the god Marduk created the world. It was a magical place where heaven and earth connected. The whole point of the Etamananki was to symbolically join the two realms. Here's an artist's interpretation of the Etamananki from Athanasius Kircher, Amsterdam, 1679. It would have been another worldly experience to climb to the top of this structure and look across the land, but not everybody was allowed up there. The Babylonians believed the Etamananki was a sort of motel for the gods. One of the rooms was reserved for Marduk and his wife, Sarpanatum. Another of the rooms was reserved for Nabu and his wife, Tashmetu. The Babylonians would have been sleeping in their mud brick hovels at night while far above them they believed the gods were physically watching them from their tall rooms. The tower also became a center of science. In the 17th century BC, astrologers observed Venus for the first time at the top of the tower. By the 7th century BC, astrologers had mapped the stars with such precision that they could predict eclipses. But what happened to the tower? It wasn't God who tore it down like the Bible says. Historical records say it was a Syrian king, Sennacherib, who shattered the tower when he went to war against Babylon. It was rebuilt partially by King Nebuchadnezzar, then tore down a second time by King Xerxes of Persia. He was the one in the movie 300 who fought the Spartans. In the 4th century BC, Alexander the Great invaded Persia and promised he would rebuild the Etamananki, but he died soon after. The tower slowly faded from memory. It wasn't for another 2,000 years until archaeologists found the ruins of the Etamananki in Babylon. Pope Sergius III Pope Sergius III only became Pope because the Pope before him died, supposedly murdered by Pope Sergius III himself. Sergius was born a Roman aristocrat in the late 9th century. He grew up with a privileged life and became consecrated Bishop of Caer when he was just a young man. He took part in the bizarre trial of a corpse thanks to Pope Stephen VI, and when he tried to get into the papal office the first time, he was denied. But after the death of Pope Theodore II, there was mass confusion in the Vatican. Right at the end of the 9th century, there was a time of major political upheaval in Italy. There was pope after pope and violence in the streets, and the aristocratic families and factions of Italy were at war with one another. When a chance finally revealed itself, Sergius III seized the seat of the Vatican with a small army he commanded on January 29, 904 AD. He then overthrew anti-pope Christopher, who'd ruled for only a few months after deposing Pope Leo V. Rumor has it that Sergius felt bad after throwing Christopher and Leo in jail, so he had them both strangled to ease his guilt. This was supposedly done to save them from the miseries of being imprisoned. Before we move on to number 9, I wanted to give a shout out to AK Knight for giving us the super thanks. This channel wouldn't be what it is without supporters like you, and if you haven't already, subscribe!
Number 9. Pope John XII Pope John XII's time in the Vatican can be summed up in a few words, drinking, gambling, murder, and incest. Historians say Pope John XII marked the absolute lowest point in Vatican history. In 2000 years of popes, John XII was arguably the most corrupt of them all. He was a robber, a murderer, and an atrocious priest. And French historian Louis-Marie de Comenon said he soiled the chair of St. Peter for nine long years. John was the supreme pontiff from 955 AD until 964 AD. His rule was during the dark century of the Vatican, the time known to historians as the Papal Pornocracy. Ever since the collapse of the Carolingian Empire that had so bravely protected the legitimacy of the Church, Rome and the Vatican had fallen into the greedy hands of squabbling Italian families. The Church was run by a bunch of Mafia families, and it went on for centuries. John was placed on the throne when he was only 18 years old, and he used the wealth of Italy to fund a lavish lifestyle, even outlandish by Pope standards. He also had a wild gambling habit that cost the Church an obscene amount of money. The Lateran Palace was turned into the biggest and most luxurious brothel in Rome, and John openly committed unspeakable acts of sin. If there was one particular thing John did that was atrocious, it was this. When pilgrims journeyed to Rome to see the Holy Vatican, John would frequently kidnap them, trap them in his Pope Palace, and make them do unspeakable things with him. Number 8. The Trial of Pope Formosus Pope Formosus spent his entire life in the political arena of the Vatican. First he was a bishop, then he served as a legate to Bulgaria in 866 AD. He went on diplomatic missions in the 860s and 70s AD, and he was generally well-liked, especially by the people of Bulgaria. Boris I asked the Pope to make Formosus the Archbishop of Bulgaria, but Pope Nicholas I refused. Then there was some drama between Formosus, the newly coronated Charles the Bald, and the widow of Louis the German. Formosus was then excommunicated for deserting the diocese when he fled Rome and refused to return. He claimed that he was scared the emperor would have him killed. Formosus was excommunicated in July of 876 AD, but this was an issue because he was already in line for the papacy. In 891 AD, despite having once been excommunicated, Formosus became the pope, and while he was in the seat of power, he got mixed up in even more drama. Formosus despised Emperor Guy III of Spoleto. He created issues with Constantinople while trying to liberate Italy from Guy's family. The current pope then died in 896 AD and was replaced by Pope Boniface VI. Then, just 15 days later, Boniface was replaced by Pope Stephen VI. Pope Stephen VI was a staunch supporter of everyone Pope Formosus hated, and to take revenge on the old pope, Stephen had Formosus' corpse dug out of the ground and put on trial. He'd only been dead for about seven months at this time, as his body was still rotting and in decay. He was dressed in papal vestments and his skeleton was seated on the throne. He was even given a young deacon to be his attorney. It was the most bizarre trial in Vatican history, and in the end, Pope Formosus was found guilty of all the crimes put against him, and his name was to be removed from all official records. Number 7. Pope Julius II Pope Julius II ruled for a fairly long time compared to many other popes. He was the supreme pontiff from 1503 until 1513 AD. Born in Genoa, Italy in 1443 AD, he was the 216th pope to take the seat of power. He even took the name Julius after the Roman dictator Julius Caesar, and that should be enough to show you exactly where this is going. Pope Julius was all about conquering. He wanted to regain all the papal lands that had been lost in recent years. Unlike so many popes who sat on their thrones counting their money, Julius went into battle. He joined the struggle on the battlefield with a sword in his hand. He also had two nicknames, Warrior Pope, for obvious reasons, and Terrible Pope, due to his nasty temper. Julius II wasn't the worst or the most blasphemous pope in history, though. There were a few great things he did. Julius established the Swiss Guards, which are still around today. He had Michelangelo complete the Statue of Moses, which took nearly all of Michelangelo's 88 years. And he even founded the Vatican Museums, which today are some of the greatest museums in the world. The pope's only real downfall was that he was mean and a bit of a warmonger. Italy saw the man as their savior for a brief period, but only because he truly enjoyed fighting the French 
which is an odd thing for a pope to take pleasure in. Number 6. Pope Leo X Pope Julius II was most likely the biggest supporter of the arts the Vatican ever saw, but his successor, Pope Leo X, was a close second. Leo also loved the arts and went above and beyond to fund great high Renaissance artists in Rome. But whereas Julius II fought in battle to reclaim Italy, Leo X reveled in lavish extravagance that brought on the Protestant Reformation. Art and scholarship reached their peak in Rome, but Leo X was a glutton. He was once quoted as saying, Since God has given us the papacy, let us enjoy it. Leo became Pope in 1513 AD. His predecessor, Pope Julius II, had just cleaned the Vatican's financial books. They were spotless, and the Vatican was rich again. But then Leo X plunged the church into bankruptcy. The territories that had been won by Julius with force and diplomacy were lost by Leo's laziness. When it became clear there was something wrong, rather than owning up to it, Leo started pawning things from the Vatican. Leo X was the mastermind behind selling positions inside the church, something known as selling indulgences. The gross corruption of Leo X would bring about the biggest catastrophe the church had ever seen in the form of the Protestant Reformation. It was his corruption 500 years ago that helped Christianity begin to lose its stranglehold on the minds of people. Nobody trusted the church anymore, and it was a blow to the Vatican from which they've never truly recovered. Number 5. Pope Boniface VIII Pope Boniface VIII was one of the most controversial popes in history. His reign lasted eight years and marked the beginning of a steep decline for the medieval church. He was born Benedetto, a member of the extremely powerful Italian Caetini family, and his great-uncle was Pope Alexander IV. The man on the papal throne prior to Boniface was Pope Celestine V, one of the only popes in history who voluntarily gave up the throne. He abandoned being the pope for seemingly no reason on December 13, 1294 AD. Historians believe Boniface may have been part of a small group of elitists who convinced Celestine to give up his seat or die. Then, just ten days after Celestine's resignation, Boniface VIII was named the pope. But the thing that makes him so controversial is the Unam Sanctum. This was a declaration made by the Pope that he acted on the behalf of God. The declaration said, Pope Boniface VIII was an agent of God, the holiest authority on earth. It was a declaration meant to make the Pope not only the leader of the Christian Church, but the leader of everyone on the planet. Boniface wanted to be more powerful than any of the kings in Europe. The Unum Sanctum didn't go well for Boniface, though. He went on to excommunicate the King of France, but this was a bad idea because the King sent men to abduct Boniface. Then, a few days later, Boniface was found dead. If you were the Pope, what name would you take for yourself? Let us know in the comments, and while you're at it, subscribe to the channel! Number 4. Pope Alexander VI Pope Alexander VI was one of those traditional popes who had orgies, bribed officials, sold church offices, and was just generally dirty. Alexander VI was born in Spain in 1431 AD with the birth name Rodrigo Borgia. His family was extraordinarily important as they had their hands in every honeypot in Europe. His uncle became Pope Calixtus III in 1455 AD, and the entirety of the Borgia family was getting positions in the church. Nephews were becoming cardinals, and even 25-year-old Rodrigo was given the position of vice-chancellor of the Holy See. There weren't enough positions to give family members, though, so nepotism began to run rampant. Rodrigo Borgia became Pope Alexander VI through an aggressive campaign of bribery following the death of Pope Innocent VIII, in 1492 AD. He was 61 years old when he took office, but that didn't stop him from handing out jobs like candy. On October 30th, 1501 AD, Pope Alexander VI hosted the first official Vatican orgy, but it's known more tamely today as the Banquet of Chestnuts. Alexander, his son, and their closest friends had a party with 50 prostitutes, and rumor has it that they made wagers on who would last the entire night. Number 3. Pope Innocent VIII After assuming the role of Pope in 1484 AD, one of Innocent VIII's first acts was to condemn witchcraft. Innocent issued a public decree called a bull condemning all forms of witchcraft, and years later, near the end of his life, the Pope drank the blood of children. 
Yes, he literally drank the blood of at least three young boys as a way to try and cheat death. Pope Innocent and those in his close personal circle had a strong opinion on magic. They were all about persecuting witches across Europe and burning women alive. Innocent also helped bankrupt the treasury at the Vatican, which wasn't the first time in history it was done. He interfered frequently in Italian politics, and he played his own sneaky game where he'd pit certain monarchs against one another. Most historians agree he was a man of low private morals who was unworthy of the seat he held. But then, in 1492 AD, the Pope had a stroke. He fell into a coma, and doctors feared the worst. To try and bring him out of the coma, the Pope's doctors forced him to swallow blood extracted from either Christian or Jewish children. The story is always changing, though, so it's not clear whose blood he drank. What the legends all have in common is that three kids were murdered by Vatican physicians, and drained of their blood. The blood was then poured down Pope Innocent's throat. But not surprisingly, it didn't work, and he died. And on his deathbed, Pope Innocent supposedly apologized for being such a bad leader of the church. Number 2. Pope Gregory IX Pope Gregory IX is the most hated pope who ever lived. He wasn't hated during his rule, though, which began on March 19, 1227 AD. He's hated by people today because he started a war on cats. Gregory also began the crusade of 1239 AD, but that wasn't against furry felines. The thing with cats in the Middle Ages was that people thought they were agents of the devil, especially black cats. They were feared by everyone who believed the crazy things that came from the Vatican. Pope Gregory was a staunch believer that cats carried with them a piece of Satan's spirit, and according to him, cats simply couldn't be trusted. This went beyond all superstition into the realm of insane paranoia. Starting around 1233 AD, Pope Gregory initiated the mass extermination of cats in Europe. It's unclear how many were killed, but it was a lot. For a full year, Europeans were urged to bag up all the cats they could find and either burn them or throw them in a river. But don't worry, the cats got a late revenge. Without felines stalking the gutters and sewers of medieval cities, the rat population exploded. Rats carried the plague unhindered by cats, and upwards of 50% of the population died miserably from the horrible illness. Number 1. Pope Francis It's difficult for a pope to get away with the kinds of things that popes did in the Middle Ages, but today, there's a new breed of pope, one that can't do anything weird without someone with a smartphone catching them in the act. But that doesn't mean popes are much better than they used to be. Some people even believe Pope Francis is a bit off his rocker. Francis is the current head of the Catholic Church, and he has been since March 13, 2013. He's the first pope born outside Europe since the 8th century. He's originally from Argentina, where he worked as a bouncer and a janitor before joining the Society of Jesus, aka the Jesuits. Francis is also the first Jesuit pope in history and the first pope from the Southern Hemisphere. But apparently he's obsessed with the devil. Pope Francis is always making weird tweets about the evil one, the great dragon or the tempter. He has a lot of names for the devil. Pope Francis holds the belief that the devil is a real person. He's also warned the public multiple times about elegant demons lurking in the Vatican. Nobody knows if Francis is nuts or if he really thinks there are evil souls in the Vatican. But it could all just be a ruse, and behind the scenes, he could be the truly evil one. The Cherubim The first appearance of the mysterious cherubim is in the third chapter of the book of Genesis. The story goes that God created the world, and that by doing so he formed two realms, the sky realm and the mortal realm of earth. But the wilderness was a harsh place where surviving meant dealing with constant struggles, so God also created a garden, a place mentioned in the Bible called the Garden of Eden. This was designed to be a magical place in his earthly domain of chaos and savagery. After God created humans, he gave them the option of living inside the safety of his garden or being cast out into the wilderness. The only stipulation was that the first humans, meaning Adam and Eve, had to follow his exact instructions. They could live forever without pain or suffering if they'd only follow the rule of God. We all know how this story ends. Adam and Eve, the only two people on the planet, refused to be told what to do and instead rebelled against God. They were then kicked out of the Garden of Eden and God replaced them with heavenly cherubim. 
them. These creatures are angels, but not the kind of angels you see in modern media. They don't even look like the angels you see in medieval paintings. In Ezekiel, the cherubim are described as being completely covered in eyes. Their entire bodies and their many wings were supposedly all covered in eyeballs. But why did God send them to the garden after the expulsion of Adam and Eve? The Bible suggests their presence there was meant to send a message, and that message was that Eden was a place only for heavenly beings, where heaven and earth are one and God's will is law. If the Bible is to be believed, the cherubim are still in the garden to this day, blocking its entrance so that no man may ever enter again. Keep in mind that depending on which biblical literature we are talking about, the cherubim take on many different forms. They've been described as heavenly animals, bird-like mutants, and human angels with wings. They appear in Christian, Jewish, and Islamic literature, and in most cases they serve as the throne bearers of God and as symbols of His mercy. And now for number 9, but first it's shout out time. I wanted to give a big thank you to Panda Teddy and Sean Krisky for supporting this channel. Be sure to subscribe if you haven't already for more videos about amazing discoveries, or dinosaurs, or mysterious angels from the Bible. Number 9 the Seven Archangels In the book of Revelation, John sees a vision of the apocalypse. It begins with the breaking of the seven seals and culminates in the blowing of the seven trumpets by the seven archangels. In John's vision, the seven seals keep closed a scroll that's in heaven. As each seal is broken, the scroll inches that much closer to being unfurled, and with each seal, a new judgment is unleashed upon the world of man. The judgments are utterly brutal and usher in the time of tribulation. The first four scrolls release the four horsemen of the apocalypse. The Antichrist rides out on a white horse, followed by warfare on a red horse. The third horse is black, and its rider spreads famine and pestilence across the world. And the fourth seal releases the pale horse, whose rider's name is Death, and whom Hades follows closely behind. The result of this is that the earth is plunged into chaos, with a quarter of the population dying from war and plague. But that's only the beginning, since there are still three seals to go. The fifth seal brings about the death of the martyrs, while the sixth seal results in a devastating earthquake. The seventh and final seal begins a silence in heaven, and thus the seven trumpets are given to the seven archangels, who bring about an even worse series of events. The Bible doesn't give very many specifics on the seven angels who blow the trumpets. Revelation never even identifies them, simply calling them angels. But there's other literature from the Second Temple period, between 586 BC and 70 AD, that names Michael and Gabriel as being part of the angelic group. But we don't learn their real names until the Book of Enoch, which isn't even technically part of the Bible. This is a forbidden biblical script, one that's considered non canonical. Yet a huge part of Christian lore comes from these so-called forbidden texts. In Enoch, the seven angels are Gabriel, Michael, Seriel, Raguel, Raphael, Uriel, and Ramiel. They are described as beautiful, wonderful, and honored princes who take care of the seven heavens. They are said to be the ones who blow the trumpets and pour the seven bowls of judgment onto the earth. The seven trumpets and their judgments are as follows. The first trumpet brings utter devastation to the planet, hail and fire rain down from the sky, and a third of the earth is burned. The second trumpet turns the sea into blood and kills a third of the living creatures in the ocean. The third trumpet poisons the human water supply, and the fourth trumpet pulls the stars from the sky and destroys the moon. The fifth trumpet releases Satan and a host of demonic locusts. Then the sixth trumpet unleashes an army of 200 million soldiers made up of either demons or angels. This army goes on to kill most of the people on the planet. And finally, the seventh trumpet announces the return of Christ and the end of the apocalypse. Number 8. Archangel Uriel Archangels aren't really part of the traditional Bible. Just like how the seven angels who blow the trumpets are only named in the Book of Enoch, most archangels come from various extra-biblical literature. A great example is Archangel Uriel. He's never mentioned once in the Bible, yet he's one of the most famous angels in Christianity and Judaism. He's said to be the angel of wisdom, the angel responsible for shining God's truth into the world in the form of a bright light. He's depicted in ancient artworks as carrying around a scroll, symbolizing his great wisdom and intelligence. His name in Hebrew means, God is my light. In the Book of Enoch, Uriel is one of the archangels who blows a trumpet during the apocalypse. He is responsible for warning Noah that a 
flood is coming and therefore help save the human race. He's also mentioned in the Testament of Solomon, another book that isn't part of the official Bible. Uriel plays a major part in apocryphal texts. He's credited with being the angelic guardian who protects the Tree of Life in the Garden of Eden with the flaming sword, and he was supposedly the one who checked the doorposts of the Israelites to make sure they were marked with blood during Passover. Uriel is also said to protect the south corner of the globe, with Gabriel protecting the north, Michael protecting the east, and Raphael guarding the west. But is Uriel a real angel? That's the biggest question Christians have to contend with. If he doesn't appear in the Bible, is he real or a piece of fiction? That all depends on how you want to interpret the Bible. 2 Timothy 3.16 says, All scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching. This could be interpreted to mean that any scripture, even the scripture not in the Bible, came from God himself. And if that's the case, Uriel is real. It's all just a matter of interpretation. Number 7. The Angel of the Pit in Hebrew, Abaddon is a word that means destruction or doom. It's the Greek version of the word Apollyon, which means destroyer. This word appears in the Bible in two forms. It's a place of destruction, and it's the name of either an angel or a demon. Different interpretations have painted Abaddon in both a nefarious light and a holy one. In the Hebrew Bible, Abaddon is the word used to describe a bottomless pit, one which appears alongside Sheol. According to Jewish literature, Sheol is a place of darkness that can only be visited after death. It's not particularly well described anywhere in the Bible or the Tanakh, but it does seem to be similar to the ancient Greek underworld. It's described as a subterranean realm of the dead, where the souls of the deceased go after the body dies. It's kind of like hell, but more of a place of emptiness than a place of torment and suffering. Christian myth has a way of turning anything negative into something demonic. But the truth is that the book of Revelation explicitly states Abaddon is an angel. In the New Testament, Revelation 9.11, Abaddon is one of God's angels who happens to live in a bottomless pit and commands an army of locusts. But in the Old Testament, in Job, Proverbs, and Psalm, Abaddon is a place of destruction and has nothing to do with anything angelic or demonic. It's likely that the authors of the New Testament took the word Abaddon and made it into a physical being. Abaddon is then described as the angel of the abyss, king of the plague of locusts that torments humanity during the days of tribulation. These locusts have human faces, the teeth of lions, long hair, and the tail of a scorpion. These ungodly beasts torment humanity for five months, stinging anyone who doesn't have the seal of God on their forehead. You may have heard the name Abaddon used to describe a demon. In fact, you may have heard of the locust being released by a demon of the abyss. This is because of the way the Bible has been interpreted over the centuries. In the 1700s, Protestant commentator Matthew Henry believed Abaddon was meant to portray the Antichrist. Others, like religious writer Henry Hampton Halley, described Abaddon as Satan himself. But it's very clear in the text that Abaddon is an angel doing God's bidding, not a demon or servant of Satan. Satan. Number 6. Archangel Barachiel you won't find Barachiel in the Bible. He's another archangel who appears in extra-biblical literature. He is described as a beautiful angel wreathed in flowing white and pink robes, surrounded by ladybugs, butterflies, and hummingbirds, all the joyful creatures of heaven. Archangel Barachiel is closely associated with positivity. It's his job to provide one with a positive outlook and to connect the pure loving energy of heaven with people through their mind, body, and spirit. These days, people who believe in both angels and astrology associate Barachiel with Jupiter and with the signs Pisces and Scorpio. This is part of a New Age belief, one that isn't the slightest bit rooted in scripture. Archangel Barachiel appears briefly in the Book of Enoch, but he's not really mentioned anywhere else. He's said to be one of the angelic princes of heaven, but he isn't one of the archangels who blows a trumpet. Instead, he's believed to be one of the angels who protects the throne of God. There really isn't much of Barachiel in biblical literature, yet somehow he became a guardian angel in Byzantine and Eastern traditions. He's even a saint in the Byzantine Catholic Church, the patron saint of marriage and family life. Tradition has it that Barachiel is charged by God to watch over the converts, those who recently switched from some other religion to Christianity. Was this your first time ever hearing about Archangel Barachiel? Let us know in the comments and hit subscribe while you're at it. Number 5. 
The Watchers. We've talked a lot today about the Book of Enoch. It's one of the most descriptive extra-biblical books when it comes to angels. Without the Book of Enoch, we wouldn't be able to talk about half the angels in today's video, and yet Enoch is largely ignored by church organizations. They call it a mythical book, a piece of fiction written by somebody with no connection to Jesus Christ or God. But if we're being honest, Enoch was written around the same time as the other books in the Bible. Its author is also unknown, and it has just as much legitimacy as any verified piece of scripture. Most of the book's contents are simply trying to fill in the backstory of Genesis. The biggest issue with the book is that it's too strange and sensational, so the church never signed off on it. But let's take a look at the book anyway. The Book of Enoch claims that in the early days of the Earth, there was a group of angels called the Watchers. They were given orders by God to look after his new creations, human beings. There were 200 Watchers in total, including famous angels like Gadriel and Azazel. The Watchers rebelled against God, however, when they became obsessed with human females. We know based on every piece of biblical scripture ever written that there were no females in heaven. When these angels saw human women for the first time, they were so enamored that they abandoned God and gave in to their lust. This was what resulted in the creation of the Nephilim and the Great Flood. Gadriel was one of the five leaders of the Watchers. He and the other leaders, one of whom was Satan, joined human women in an unnatural union, which culminated in the creation of the race of evil giants known as the Nephilim. The Nephilim then terrorized the world with their barbarity and savagery. This continued until God grew so furious that he summoned a great flood to obliterate them once and for all. But the lessons taught to the humans by the fallen angels were never forgotten. According to the Book of Enoch, Gadriel was the fallen angel who taught humans how to conduct warfare and build weaponry. That means Gadriel was directly responsible for bringing violence and war into the world. Number 4. Archangel Ragel. Ragel is the Archangel of Justice and Harmony. It's his job to ensure God's will plays a role in human relationships. He makes sure people can experience fairness in their lives, and he also makes sure God's will is done amongst his fellow angels. He supposedly supervises the work assignments God gives to his hundreds of other angels and holds them accountable for their shortcomings. There's no mention of Ragel in modern translations of the Bible, though, but unsurprisingly, he was included in the Book of Enoch along with other Jewish and Christian non-canonical texts. He's listed as one of the seven archangels who judged the unholy angels who rebelled against God. This is one of the reasons why it's still his duty to continue supervising the holy angels who are left. Rigel ensures they don't fall like Satan, Gadriel, Azazel, and the Watchers, and all the others who left heaven. Although Rigel isn't mentioned by name in modern translations of the Bible, he may have been included a long time ago. Some scholars have argued that Rigel was named in early biblical manuscripts, specifically in the book of Revelation. He may have been one of those who assisted God in separating the humans who were faithful to Jesus Christ from those who were faithless. He's also listed as the sixth angel in Revelation, the one who releases the army of angels to punish sinners. Number 3. Archangel Cassiel Archangel Cassiel is interesting because he plays no part in the proceedings of anything. He's known only for watching the events of the universe unfold with minor interference. He's said to be the fastest of all God's creation, moving literally at the speed of God. Not even more famous archangels like Michael or Gabriel are able to keep up with Cassiel. He takes on a lot of different roles in Biblical Apocrypha, and he's mentioned briefly in the Book of Enoch. However, he mostly appears in Jewish mystical literature. There's an ancient Hebrew Hebrew charm that invokes his name to see if one's enemy has run away. Scholar Gustav Davidson wrote that Cassiel was the ruler of the seventh heaven in three Enoch. He comes up in Hechelot Rabati as the guardian of the sixth palace, and he's said to be armed with a sword imbued with lightning. But let's just take a second to talk about what Hechelot Rabati is. Hechelot literature is a collection of ancient Jewish texts describing visions of various heavenly palaces. They're more commonly known as the books of the palaces and the chariot. It's esoteric Jewish work that was likely written in late antiquity, maybe as recently as the early Middle Ages. It's all part of the Jewish Apocrypha, which is tied very closely to the Christian Apocrypha. It's all pseudo-biblical writings, which were created to make more sense of what's happening in the core Bible. The Hechelot literature discusses the lesser and greater palaces of heaven as a way to make it clearer to people what heaven has in store for them. The Bible wasn't really descriptive enough to get people on board with 
with the whole idea, so Jewish authors added a lot to the original source material. That's why we have so many visions of heaven, hell, demons, and angels that don't come from the Bible. There are hundreds of angels and demons because they were invented by other authors. Cassiel happened to be the angel charged with guarding the sixth greater palace of heaven in Jewish law. Number 2. Sandolphin Sandolphin is the angel of music ruling over the music in heaven and helping the people of earth communicate with God through musical prayer. He is the spiritual brother of Archangel Metatron, who we'll discuss more in detail a bit later. In biblical myth, Sandolphin ascended to his position as the musical angel after living a moral life. He's one of the very few angels that we see living life as a human, then ascending to heaven to be an angel. This is remarkable because it comes from much older mythologies where demigods frequently ascended to the realm of the gods. For example, Hercules started out as a demigod, then ascended to Mount Olympus after his death. There are some scholars who say Sandolphin was in fact the prophet Elijah, turned into an angel after he ascended to heaven on a horse-drawn chariot made of pure light. The Book of Enoch says Sandolphin rules over over the third heaven. However, the Islamic Hadith claims Sandolphin rules over the fourth heaven. The Jewish Zohar goes on to say Sandolphin rules the seventh heaven. One of the biggest issues with these non-canonical texts is that none of them can agree on anything. The sacred Jewish Kabbalah places Sandolphin at the exit from the spheres of the Tree of Life, standing guardian there. He also joins the angelic armies of the Archangel Michael, fighting against Satan and the forces of evil in the final days. Number 1. Metatron Metatron is an angel who appears primarily in Jewish texts. He's mentioned three times in the Talmud, several times in mystical rabbinic literature, and in a few passages of the Agatha. The name never appears in the Torah or the Bible, but it does show up in Islamic tradition. Islamists call him Metatron, the Angel of the Veil. No matter which religious mythology we look at, Metatron is generally the same. There are two main stories about where he came from. One says he was the greatest archangel ever, created at the same time that the universe sprang into existence. This train of thought places Metatron at the peak of the angelic hierarchy, created by God alongside the cosmos itself. The other story has to do with Enoch. Some religious sects believe Enoch was transformed into an angel by God, and his name became Metatron. The Evolution of the Exorcist Exorcisms have been a part of Christianity ever since the days of Jesus Christ. In the Biblical Gospels, Jesus himself is involved in a handful of exorcisms. In the Gospel of Luke, a boy becomes possessed by a demon and foams at the mouth while violently spasming. But then Jesus comes along and uses his holy powers to expel the demon from the child's body. Jesus also promises his followers that with the strength of God, they too can banish demons. In the 2nd century AD, Christians used the name of Jesus during rituals to expel evil spirits from the souls of their friends. In the early days of Christianity, exorcisms were even used to convert people. Priests would perform exorcisms in public spaces as a way to convince non-believers of their spiritual power. They were trying to make people believe that Christians were able to perform more effective exorcisms than the pagans. Things really started to heat up in the Middle Ages, though. That was when specific priests were trained by the church specifically to become exorcists. This is still the case today in the Roman Catholic Church and most Eastern Orthodox traditions. But not all exorcisms were as intense as you see in the movies. The Middle Ages saw the rise of something called the minor exorcism. This was used on people who weren't necessarily possessed by evil. During baptisms, a minor exorcism would be performed under the assumption that everyone is already under some kind of evil spiritual control. It was in the 15th century that demons became a thing to be feared in Western Europe. These were the days of witch trials and demonologists. There are so many accounts of priests exercising demons between the 15th and 17th century that it would be impossible to list them all. Priests became so crazed for exorcisms, they began to banish evil spirits from animals, too. It wouldn't be until the Enlightenment, a period that began in the 17th century and ended in the 19th century, that Europeans stopped believing in the superstitions of demonic possession. Intellectuals and the church itself started to accept that psychology was likely behind demonic possession. However, the Catholic Church has never stopped training exorcists, and one of the biggest driving forces of exorcisms today is Pentecostalism, a branch of Christianity that emphasizes spiritual experience in everyday life. 
One of the few places in the world where the belief in demonic possession remains high is the United States of America. And now for number 9. But first, I wanted to give a big shout out to Carrier Aubrey and Amanda Marshall. Thanks so much for watching and supporting OE. If you're new here, be sure to subscribe and join the family. Number 9. Roland Doe Exorcism wouldn't be the hot topic it is today without William Peter Blatty's 1971 novel called The Exorcist. The book turned into a horror film in 1973, and since then, Americans have been obsessed. But what a lot of people don't realize is that the events from the fictional movie The Exorcist were inspired by a real case. In the 1940s, a group of priests from the Roman Catholic Church performed exorcisms on a boy who was only identified as Roland Doe. Roland was born into a family of Lutherans who lived in Maryland. He was an only child, and at a young age he was introduced by his aunt to a Ouija board. According to those close to the case, it all started after the death of Roland's aunt. This was when the family started to experience strange noises. Furniture was moving on its own, and vases would fly off the shelf and shatter against the wall. But these strange occurrences would only happen whenever the boy was nearby. Eventually, the family reached out to their local pastor, Luther Mile Schultz. Even the pastor was a bit dubious, though, so he agreed to watch over the boy for a night and see for himself what was going on within the home. Much to the priest's shock, household objects and furniture moved on their own when the boy was in the room. The priest then suggested that the family get in touch with the Catholics. It's unclear how many exorcisms Roland Doe was involved in, but it was a lot. A Roman Catholic priest named Edward Hughes conducted one at Georgetown University Hospital. During the exorcism, the boy supposedly slipped out of his restraints and used a broken bed spring to slash the priest's arm. The exorcism was then deemed a failure, and the family relocated to St. Louis. But the boy's demonic possession continued in the new city. Once more, priests visited Roland, this time with scientists from College Church and St. Louis University. Everyone involved witnessed the bed shaking and heard the boy speaking in tongues using a voice that wasn't his own. The archbishop then granted permission for another exorcism, and this one took place at the Alexian Brothers Hospital, where psychologists assisted the priests. During the exorcism, one of the Jesuit priests claimed he saw the words hell and evil appear on the boy's flesh, as if by magic. There were supposedly other exorcisms on the boy that all failed. The one in St. Louis seemed to do the trick, though. The priests, without ever revealing the boy's name, said he went on to live a perfectly normal life after the demon was forced out of his body. Number 8. Clara Germana Celle At a small mission school in South Africa, Father Erasmus Horner heard a very unusual confession from one of his Catholic students. The year was 1906, and the student's name was Clara Germana Celle. In a confession booth, the young girl admitted that she'd made a pact with the devil. At first, the priest didn't take too much of Clara's confession to heart. After all, she was only a young girl, and he attributed the confession to an active imagination. But then the strange and erratic behavior started, causing the nuns and priests at the school to become increasingly concerned. Then, on August 20, 1906, Clara ripped her clothes off like a transforming werewolf and began to growl. She then had a full-blown conversation in a bizarre voice with entities no one else could see. Clara was quoted as saying, You have betrayed me, you have promised me days of glory, but now you treat me cruelly. It was believed that Clara was arguing with whatever evil entity she'd made a pact with, which had evidently betrayed her. One of the nuns wrote that she'd never heard an animal make a sound like what was released from Clara's body. She also said that neither a lion nor a bull could make such a horrifying noise. In the days that followed, Clara began to develop powers. She divulged secrets from the personal lives of those near her, and she could somehow speak foreign languages that she'd never heard before. She was also imbued with inhuman strength and would often break through her restraints. And then there was the levitating. Clara would levitate five feet off her bed, only to be brought back down on the mattress by a quick spray of holy water. The exorcism was performed on September 11, 1906. It lasted the entire month morning and continued into the dark hours of the night. Clara nearly strangled one priest to death during the ordeal, but in the end, the demon left her body. And around 170 people witnessed the whole thing at the chapel. But this story isn't over yet. 
A year later, Clara made another pact with the devil, and this time the exorcism lasted two days. When the demon was finally vanquished yet again, everyone in the room reported smelling the foulest odor imaginable. No record exists as to what happened to Clara after the second possession, but hopefully she stopped trusting the devil. Number 7. The Pope's Exorcist Father Gabriel Lamorth passed away in 2016. Prior to the priest's death, he admitted to national news outlets that he'd performed no less than 100,000 exorcisms in his life. But you've likely never heard of any of them. That's because Father Amorth was the official exorcist of the Vatican, and the exorcisms he performed were top secret. Father Amorth was born in Italy in 1925. He fought with the resistance in World War II against the fascists, and after the war he earned himself a law degree and worked briefly as a journalist. He didn't become a priest until 1951. After many years of priestly duty, Gabriel was appointed assistant to Cardinal Ugo Paletti in 1986. Paletti was the chief exorcist of Rome at the time. After Paletti's death, Father Amorth took over his position. He remained in a position for the rest of his life and even wrote a book about it called An Exorcist Tells His Story. One of his greatest accomplishments was founding the International Association of Exorcists, an unusual organization that still exists today. Nowadays, exorcisms are making a huge comeback. The practice stopped being popular at the end of the 1600s, but in 2017, Pope Francis sent a message to priests saying they shouldn't hesitate to call an exorcist whenever it seems necessary. Before his death, Father Amorth admitted that 98% of his patients needed a psychiatrist more than a priest. He also said the other 2% were definitely possessed by a demon. But 2% of 100,000 is still 2,000, and that's a lot of demonic possessions going on right under our noses. Number 6. Annalise Michel Annalise Michel grew up in West Germany in the 1960s. Her family was devoutly Catholic, and she lived a fairly normal life. But then the unexpected happened when Annalise was just 16 years old. One day she blacked out at school and strolled around in a fugue state, and when she finally snapped out of it she couldn't remember anything that happened. Her friends at school and her family said it was as if she'd fallen into a trance. The event came and went, and nobody thought much of it. But a year later something similar occurred. Annalise woke up in a trance and peed her bed. She also started to convulse uncontrollably. This was 1960s Germany, a time when people didn't typically treat demonic possession as a reality. So Annalise went to a neurologist instead of a priest. The doctors diagnosed her with temporal lobe epilepsy, a condition that can cause seizures, memory loss, and hallucinations. It's been attributed to demonic possession since the days of the Babylonians. Annalise was then given drugs, and she enrolled in university. But the drugs didn't help, and by the end of the year, Annalise Annalise wholeheartedly believed she was possessed by a demonic entity. The biggest thing about Annalise's possession was that she was aware of it. She saw the face of the devil in reflective surfaces, and she claimed that demons whispered in her ears. And as she tried to sleep at night, horrible voices spoke inside her head. According to Annalise, they told her she was damned and would rot eternally in hell. Annalise was the one who sought out priests to help her with her possession, but the priest she spoke to wouldn't do it and instead told her that she needed medicine. By this point, Annalise was rapidly deteriorating. She was eating spiders and biting the heads off birds, and she did even worse things that we can't mention because they're so horrific. But then, finally, priest Ernst Alt agreed to perform an exorcism. Annalise would undergo 67 exorcisms over the next 10 months. The priests involved believed she was possessed by Lucifer, Judas, Roman Emperor Nero, and Adolf Hitler. Unfortunately, though, these attempts to save Annalise proved unsuccessful, and she passed away on July 1, 1976. Her death, however, didn't come from the demons inside her, but from malnutrition and dehydration. As a result, her parents and the priests involved were charged with negligent homicide. The priests were found guilty of manslaughter and given six months in jail, though the sentence was suspended. Her parents parents weren't given any punishment since the courts decided they'd suffered enough. It's still unclear from a spiritual standpoint what happened to Annalise. Scientists say it was a clear case of mental illness gone horribly wrong, but what do you think? Did Annalise die from being possessed by a dead Roman emperor, or was it negligence since the priest allowed her to waste away and starve? Number 5. Mesopotamian Exorcisms 
Ancient Mesopotamia is most famous for being home to the first truly complex society of people on the planet. These civilizations developed agriculture and animal domestication 8,000 years ago, and by 3000 BC, they built the first great cities and invented written language. They even built the first wheel and performed the first ever exorcism. Scientists know what happened in ancient Mesopotamia because of the preserved writing they left behind. The Library of Ashur Benipal contains a well of ancient tablets detailing the reigns of monarchs and military campaigns. Other tablets discuss ancient codes of law, trade routes, and even things like domestic disputes. It's through these texts that scientists came to learn about the world's first exorcists. A series of tablets written around 700 BC detail a ceremony used to drive away evil. The ceremony could be used to banish evil magic and protect the target from further corruption. It could also cripple the person responsible for casting the evil spell in the first place. The tablets contain nearly a hundred spells and incantations to be uttered during the ritual, and on the final tablet are the directions for what to do throughout the ceremony. Scientists believe this is the first exorcist guide ever written. It was intended to teach early exorcists how to banish evil. They weren't kicking demons out of souls, but it was still extremely similar. These kinds of ceremonies would be adapted in the years to come to combat evil spirits and treacherous demons. Have you ever used a Ouija board? Let us know in the comments below, and while you're at it, subscribe! Number 4. Anna Eklund Anna Eklund is the main character in the 1930s book Begone Satan. It was written by Carl Vogel and was used for inspiration in the 2016 film The Exorcism of Anna Eklund. But Anna's real name was most likely Emma Schmidt. She was born in Marathon, Wisconsin in 1882. Her mother perished in 1890, leaving the eight-year-old girl with her alcoholic father. Carl Vogel most likely heard the story secondhand and then changed the name in his book out of respect for the family. But most of the facts are the same as what happened to little Emma in rural Wisconsin. Emma attended church regularly until something weird happened at the age of 14. Emma could no longer enter a church without violent thoughts consuming her. She had uncontrollable visions of hurting priests and desecrating the church grounds, and eventually these bizarre thoughts became so bad that Emma stopped going to church altogether. That was when locals got in touch with Father Theophilus Reisinger. Theophilus was a German capuchin priest who moved to the Midwest in 1912, and soon after he arrived he performed the first exorcism on Emma. At first it seemed to be a success. Emma was able to go back into church without worrying about attacking somebody. Rumors at the time claimed that Emma was possessed because of her aunt Mina, who was apparently a witch. She put cursed herbs in Emma's food to force demonic entities into her body. Emma was then besieged by demonic entities again in August 1928. Her possession was so bad the second time that she had to be restrained on an iron bed. Her body twisted and contorted unnaturally as she vomited bile and other nasty liquids. But after several months, Emma was finally freed of her demons on December 23rd. She jumped out of bed and said the demons were gone. Then she got back to her life as normal and was never possessed again. Number 3. Medieval Demons Archaeologists excavating an ancient Roman villa in England came across an unusual skeleton. The skeleton belonged to a man who lived during the Middle Ages, and according to experts, he may have been buried in the remote countryside because of a jaw deformity that made the community think he was full of evil spirits. A small hole in his head seems to suggest that he may have had surgery to try to exorcise those evil spirits. Hampshire Archaeology says the man was between 35 and 40 years old when he died. His right hand was missing and some of his foot bones were gone when they found him. It's unclear if the damage was done before death as a punishment or if it was the result of grave robbers. The hole drilled into his skull, however, definitely happened prior to death. Dave Allen, a member of the archaeological team, says the hole in the man's skull was either to relieve chronic pain or to make a route for the demons to escape. The man's lower jaw was deformed likely because of a problematic birth, and it would have started to be noticeable before he was even a year old. Deformities weren't something you'd want to have in the Middle Ages. Anyone who looked even remotely different was viewed with great suspicion in medieval European communities. When somebody wasn't quite right, locals were quick to blame demons or witchcraft. In this case, it seems the community attributed demons to the man's unusual appearance. 
To fix the man's deformity, a doctor used a primitive bone drill to get the demons out of his head. But when that didn't work, who knows what happened. New growth tissue over the wound shows the operation was successful and the man lived after the surgery. But then he was buried in the middle of nowhere, face down in a shallow grave. Even though he survived the surgery, he was obviously still shunned and despised by his community. Number 2. The Tsar Ritual the ancient Tsar ritual began in Ethiopia, though there's no known date for its origins. Legend has it the practice first came about in the Ethiopian city of Harar, then spread into Eritrea and Somalia. It eventually became its own cult, with rituals being held across Africa and all the way into Egypt and Persia. Very little is known of the Tsar ritual other than what travelers in the 19th century wrote. One traveler described the cult as sacrificing a goat and mixing its blood with butter, and this was all apparently done to heal someone who was sick. The whole point behind the Tsar ritual is to banish demons and evil entities. It's a type of exorcism that's been around since the days of the Abyssinian dynasty, which was founded in the 13th century AD. In Ethiopia, Tsar is a word that describes a malevolent spirit or demon. The belief in such creatures of the spirit realm is widespread even today in Christian and Muslim communities. Communities. But exactly how the ritual unfolds depends on which spirit is possessing the person in need of the exorcism. In local folklore, there are over 88 different emissaries of evil who can corrupt a person's soul and cause them to grow sick. The thing that's really unique about the Tsar ritual is that it's mostly women in charge of it. Women gather together, sing and dance to drive out the evil forces occupying the afflicted. While they don't typically spill blood anymore, women still perform the ritual on a fairly regular basis. Unlike like the exorcisms we think of today, the Tsar ritual is ancient and has nothing to do with the church. Number 1. Martha Brossier Martha Brossier was a faker. In France during the 16th century, Martha accompanied her father across the country and exhibited herself on stage while pretending to be possessed by a demon. Martha would contort her body as though the spirits were angling her limbs unnaturally. She could roll her eyes in the back of her head and rumble guttural speech from her stomach. To the peasants who showed up to watch the performances, Martha looked as though she were possessed by the devil himself. But it was all for entertainment purposes. Her father had worked as a weaver before the traveling show and never made much money. But after his daughter displayed symptoms of demonic possession, he had the idea to make money from it. Their claim was that Martha had been cursed by a witch who lived next door and that she couldn't get the demon out of her body. While the father and daughter duo were on the road, priests would often show up to their performances and try to exorcise Martha's demon. Martha would act as if the attempt worked and the demon was gone. But seconds later, the entity would come back. Soon enough, Martha and her father caught the attention of Michel Mariscor, King Henry IV's personal physician. The whole country had learned of the traveling possessed girl, and Michel was given the task of finding out the truth. The physician used a fragment of wood that he claimed came from the very cross Jesus Christ was crucified on to taunt the demons living inside Martha. She reacted violently to the piece of wood, but then Michelle revealed that it was just an ordinary piece of lumber. There was nothing special about it. Michelle had put the real piece of the cross in Martha's mouth to depress her tongue while he studied her, and yet she hadn't reacted at all to what Michelle claimed was the real piece of the cross. In the end, Martha and her father were exposed as frauds. The faker was then thrown in jail for several months, and when she got out, Martha took her weird show underground. In the years to follow, she'd hold seances in secret, but nobody knows what became of her. Do you believe demons really possess? people? Let us know what you think in the comments down below. If you like this video, be sure to give it a thumbs up and subscribe to the channel. Thanks so much for watching, and we'll see you in the next one. Bye.